you've got to have really good relationships across all the different functional and organizational teams within your company. At the end of the day, my ability to get to the right price or to help the company get to the right price is all driven off of the teams of people that, that you work with to get there. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal to stand in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Cost 15 times the price. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the regulated relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving. Today, our guest is John Peacock. And here are three things you want to know about John before we start. He is a Senior VP for Strategic Pricing at ASRC Federal. He is an expert at government contracting. And he's starting to enjoy the idea of having two kids that drive themselves. And he said he's enjoying it because he wants to work more hours. Love that. Welcome, John. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's going to be fun. Tell us, how did you get into pricing? No, I actually ended up, didn't ever plan on getting into pricing. And I'm not sure anyone ever, ever actually does. When I was coming out of college, I was interested in a company that had a good combination of finance, which was my undergrad, and management information systems, which I ended up doing in graduate school. And it was a great combination. I actually didn't get the job, but I asked them for an internship, unpaid. They gave it to me. They then offered me a position three months later and paid me for the summer. And that was kind of the first piece in the combining those two pieces. That then ended up getting more into the combination of IT and finance, which led me into a company called Tech Systems, which was trying to take staffing to the next level by taking like things like project management, program management, outsourcing, things like that, you know, IMAX moves, stuff like that. And so it just kind of built. I, I found myself in a good spot in a growing organization. And, you know, one thing led to another. And, you know, 20 years later, this is where I'm at. <laughs> so is there a reason why you stayed in pricing? Did pricing itself excite you or well, within government contracting specifically, there's a couple different areas within, say, finance that you, you could find yourself in. So project control might be one, and that's really looking at programs that you've already won and you're executing to and trying to maximize both your revenue and your margin and those things. There's the, uh, the typical areas like accounting, tax, things like that that you could also get into. But pricing, what I've always found interesting is the number of people that you have to work with to be successful. You cross over all the barriers. So you're working with technical, you're working with business development, you're working with the executives, you're working with financial planning and analysis, you're working with recruiting. So you basically are working with most of the organization. And, and in order to be successful, to, to truly be successful, where you know that you're impacting the company's ability to win jobs and then be able to execute those jobs, you are on the front line there. So you get to feel the pressure of the proposals. You get to be in the briefing. So you're, you know, you have a seat at the table, which is always key. And I just found it to be the most interesting, you know, really the options that were kind of in front of me at that point. And as I've continued to kind of grow personally and professionally, the ability to have a team of people that are dependent upon you for their careers and you get to shape what they do and kind of where they go and you see now where they're all at. It's just a great combination of, of all those things that you look for. Yeah, I, one of the great things about pricing is it touches so many different places inside a company. When you start leading a pricing team, these are people that can end up going almost anywhere in the company. So it, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. You know, we, we've had everything from, you know, interns that have moved up through the ranks and gone on the good things. We've had shareholders, you know, ASRC is, is an Alaskan owned company, which makes us a little bit unique, but we've had shareholders from Alaska come in and work through the pricing ranks. And like you said, what you get is you get this understanding of how all these other groups work and how you have to be able to pull them together in order to get that proposal done, you know, in a, you know, a 30 or 45 day turn, something like that. So the pressure is there but people really get a good basis for, for what they may want to do with the rest of their lives. Nice. Yeah. There's so much I want to talk to you about, but can we start real quickly with what does ASRC do so that we, we can just use that as a jumping off point for some questions that I have for you. 
Sure. So just a little bit of background. So ASRC Federal is part of a, a larger company called ASRC, and it's actually owned by about 14,000 Native Alaskans. And so those are our, those are our shareholders. So while you maybe work with a typical company that's public and has a shareholders that you think about those, our dividends actually go towards helping our shareholders' way of life on the northern slope of Alaska. And so it's really key. And so ASRC Federal is the biggest of the companies under that umbrella. We do work across three different operating groups. That's everything from NASA, working NASA Goddard, or even even the new Orion program down in Florida. We do a lot of base ops work. So, you know, that's taking care of different bases across the country, all the way to doing, you know, Alaskan radar site work and support. And then we cross over to high-end IT work and even healthcare work. So we've got a really good diversity of programs that we support, and that creates its own challenges, especially when it comes to strategic pricing. Yeah, so would it be fair to say that you do government pricing and you also do commercial or industrial pricing? It's actually the majority of that work. I would say probably 99% of ASRC Federal is in the government field. Okay. So all those things are working for a variety of government agencies, you know, across the country. Okay, perfect. So one of the things I'm going to find fascinating about this is a quick story. Two years ago, I was hired by a client who was trying to sell to the government and the product that they had increased the probability of mission success to an intelligence organization. And I tried and tried to figure out how a government values that. Because when I do pricing for commercial or industrial, it's always, well, how much value are we delivering to our customer? And that's where we start when we try to figure out how much we're gonna charge. So how do I figure that out in a government setting? The interesting thing in the government setting is you have to look at a deal well in advance of when that final request comes out. And so you have to look at how can you shape an opportunity and that comes, you know, you work with your BD group and, and, and obviously a lot more of that than not just price, right? There's other pieces to that. It could be your past performance. You know, have you done this type of work before? What kinds of requirements can you work with the customers to make sure are required for people that respond to those things? And so you try and shape things so that they're more in your favor, but there's always going to be that competition there. And when you look at that RFP, what you're saying is, is how do I show that value to the government? What you have to try and help them do is not put an RFP out that doesn't reward showing that value to the customer, right? If you're going to put an RFP out that basically doesn't provide the basic framework for that value, it's very hard to then get credit in the evaluation because within government, you know, a big piece of government pricing is compliance. It's responding specifically to what they ask for. And you might tell me that, hey, I've got this great way to to ensure mission success, but it's going to cost 25% more than what your RFP is putting out there. You can't overcome that that type of a cost differential, even if you have that kind of a quality in there. And that's where I think sometimes you run into that, you know, the stereotype. We want to provide the best value that we can, but we also have to make sure that we're giving good feedback for the government agencies so that they – can put out the best RFPs to make sure they are getting that quality. And so you're saying we want to be involved with the decision makers as they're writing the RFP, not after the RFP is out, if at all possible. Right. Yeah. That makes, that makes a ton of of sense. At the end of the day. Yeah. At the end of the day, you're going through a multi-step process and the, the final RFP is just one of those, those steps. And so you've got to work through all of those things. If an RFP comes out and somebody comes to me with a 30-day turn and it's 10 days into the RFP and I say, okay, well, you know, what do we have now? It's much harder to win something where you're not ahead of the curve in government pricing. It's not as if there's a commercial price list that you just go grab a number off of. You know, we're not, we're not buying a Dell laptop that you can just get, anyone can go and get the same price for. It's much more specific than that. And so you've got to be ahead of the curve if you want to have a good win rate. Right. And, and what's yeah. the point of spending money on the whole proposal process if our win rates 10 percent? Right. We want to go after things that we can win. We want to maximize our shareholders. Right. Their value. 
And we want to make sure that we're providing the government with the value and the mission success, because ultimately that's what we're kind of judged against. Right. So I want to go two different directions at once, but let me, let me stay where I was. And that is yep. this client was essentially going to be a sole source. It was brand new technology. It didn't exist. And what they could do is demonstrate that they could improve mission success dramatically. And I couldn't figure out what's the dollar value. How does a government figure out what's the dollar value of another 10% probability of mission success in a sole source? Do you have any thoughts on that? Or is it just that's impossible to do? It's not that it's impossible to do, but it can be very agency specific. And then within each agency, the ability to work that problem, sometimes that might be easier in a, cert in a certain agency compared to another agency. You might simply not have the framework for that, but you could also get what would be called like a sole source award, where if the customer believes that that's the right thing, the, the right path to take, they may award you a sole source contract where there's limits on what that can be right, where you could go prove that. You could do white papers to the government where you come up with ideas on things that may improve things and you can propose things like that. So there's ways, you know, just like everything in life, everything comes down to relationships and whether it's your BD people, your program people, right, the people that are truly successful are the ones that make good relationships, right? They bridge that gap and that allows you to have those conversations and explain why there's value add. If you have the greatest product in the world, but no one will talk to you, it's not going to ever go anywhere. <laughs> That's a true statement in, in industry as well as government. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so one of the things that you brought up was win rates. And I mm -hmm. am just totally fascinated by win rates in different industries. How painful or emotional is it to lose any one deal? And what percent of deals do you expect to lose? I mean, I don't like to lose any deal. I think that, I think from a competition perspective, for good or for bad, you know, the losses sometimes stay with you longer than the wins can stay with you. And I, you know, my, my son will attest that, you know, he, he doesn't win. When we go play basketball, he doesn't, he doesn't win unless he's earned the win, right? So you, you know when you've put together a quality proposal when you have, you've done all the things that you're supposed to do. And it's still, sometimes you won't win those things, but ultimately to achieve growth, you know, you can't start, you can't start with a 10 person job and then think you're going to go win a 10,000 person job. You've got to work your way up to that. And that's where you're hoping that the pipeline that the company has. And as you review opportunities and you're looking at, you know, not only, what the job is, how big is the job? What are the requirements of the job? You know, do you have to have so many past performances for that job to show that you've done that kind of work before? You know, it could be things like it's, it's a small business. It could be other pieces to that like that. There might be system requirements. You might need what would be like a, a cost estimating system or an approved accounting system or an approved purchasing system. So you've got to make sure that you have the tools in your toolbox to respond to those things. And then once you have those things, then you get into what's our real win rate, right? And I look at that and say, I want to have some that I feel really comfortable with every year that I know we can win. I want to show a progression in size because ultimately I'm probably going to spend close to the same amount of time on a hundred million job compared to a billion dollar job. You know, so if I can win a larger job, I'm getting more bang for my buck. But I also want to find jobs where, where I have good margin because ultimately you know, we are a for-profit company, right? We're in, we're in this to have profit. The government arena, you're probably talking about lower margins typically than you see in commercial, you know, but, but the government RFPs are always coming out. So what's a good win rate? I mean, it depends on your company and your, your industry and your sector that you're in and what you're going after. I think ASRC has been, you know, very successful and historically, I think we work constantly at improving people, processes, tools, all those things that go into being successful. We're constantly investing on trying to be better than the last time that we did something. And we've, we've got a leadership team that supports positive change all the time. When you see something that you think you can do better, everyone's open to those kinds of things. And if you're not constantly trying to be better, you know, your win rate will eventually go down. And in government contracting, you're probably talking about, you know, if I want to change 2021 right now, 
that's almost over at this point. Like I'm planning on 2022 right now. I got to have enough jobs in the pipeline that I'm going after right now. So I'm getting awards for the next, the next year. So it's not a quick turn when it comes to things like that. A government RFP, it could take over a year before you get to the final award and you start working something. I mean, we've had things that have gone on for two years or three years and things like that. So the, the amount of time it takes to get to actually achieving revenue and profit on a job are much more extended sometimes, I think, than in the commercial world. Yeah, that makes sense. Pricing decisions feel risky. How nervous are you knowing you need to raise prices? When, where, and how much should you raise prices so you don't lose customers or lower your rate of new customer acquisition? It's risky enough to make you want to put it off till next year, along with any growth. But pricing doesn't have to be such a mystery. When I work with clients as their go-to resource for pricing advice, I help them better understand the value of their products and how their buyers use price to make purchase decisions. We jointly create strategies they're confident implementing. I can do the same for you. Together, you and I apply pricing frameworks to your price increase initiatives or your new product launches, or even moving to new pricing models like subscriptions. The best pricing decision you can make right now is to gain access to proven pricing advice. Take some risk out of your pricing. Learn more at impactpricing.com slash advisor. I look forward to working with you. One of the things we talked a little bit about was being involved before an RFP gets put out. I'm guessing right. that you see RFPs late in the process sometimes, and you get involved early in the process sometimes. What's the difference in win rate between those two situations? You know, you're right. You get involved at all different times in that process. And I think it's the easiest thing in the world to try and always get a, involved ahead of schedule, right? Okay, the RFP is coming out in six months. Let's start working this. But ultimately, I don't have you know, an endless team of pricers that I can just keep allocating towards things. And so there's a balance in there. There's a balance from a BD perspective. You know, how many jobs can somebody in BD handle at one time and do well? And so you've got to balance all those pieces. Is the win rate better when you're involved early? Generally, yes. You know, the further in advance that you can start doing things, you can be more constructive on draft RFPs that come out, provide better feedback. You can start looking at the financial modeling, things like that. Now, that being said, I've also had jobs that we have 10 days to submit and we throw something together and we do it the best that we can. And part of that's because you've spent so much time making sure that things that are under your control are done really well, right? So you get to that point I and mean, we've won, you know, many of those jobs too, but you kind of know when the overall team has their act together and when they don't. And when they don't, you, you know, you're, that's where you've got to identify the risk so that when it goes to senior leadership for approval to submit something, you're being as clear as you can be on where those financial risks are. And it depends on, you know, contract type, you know, a number of things that go into to how much risk the company may be, you know, maybe under with that. But ultimately it comes down to the, the quality of the information that you have. And that goes into how you bid something and that goes into how you brief something. Yeah. Some of my, uh, some of my clients, friends, however you want to look at it. Oftentimes we have these conversations mm -hmm. about how they, they tend not to win a bunch of these RFPs. And I was asking, well, are you involved early or do you just wait till the RFP comes out? And they go, oh, these are the ones where I just get an RFP and I go bid on it and I rarely win. And my advice yeah. to them was, well, why do you waste the time bidding? Because you know you're not gonna win. Does that make sense to you? Do you guys ever do that? Yeah, but you know, sometimes you don't know that until you get into the RFP. And I think sometimes companies can fall into a situation where they feel like, well, we've, we've already spent this much money. We might as well just finish it up. When the reality is, you know, you're not going to win those things. But you never want to say never. And at the end of the day, you know, ASRC, as an example, we have so many talented people. And from a technical perspective, understanding what the mission of our customers are and understanding what it takes to make sure that their missions are performed great, right? Because ultimately, when you think about launching something in the space or a radar site, things like that, like whether it's rockets or airplanes or whatever it might be, 
you know, these are real lives that are that are affected mm-hmm. if we don't do our mission well. It's hard when you have really bright people that you work with, and there's nothing more attractive than a company that just has really intelligent, smart people that know what they're doing that you can feed off of. When you have that, it's really hard to say, hey, we don't have a chance at this job because ultimately I think it's more a matter of can we get it on paper or not? And that's where, that's where you have to ask your question. Do we know the customer? I find that, our, that a win rate would be most affected potentially by lack of, of customer intimacy. So if we've never done work at a customer before and we have a week to respond to something, and we've never talked to them, we've never responded to an RFP with them, we don't have any programs with them, we don't have anyone with the area of expertise that we need, you know, there's no SMEs or program managers or anything else that have done this work before, you can kind of see where that's going, right? It's going to be very hard to win that. And then if we win that and say it's fixed price or, or it's time and materials or something like that, your risk window right, goes, goes up, right? All of a sudden, okay, this is fixed price. If I don't really know this, if I don't have a really good basis for what my solution is, you know, I can put a number to anything, but if there's 10 risks that no one's identified that are in there and we don't know about it, then we're at financial risk. And that, that puts a lot of things at risk there. And so really the level of information and expertise comes into play. Putting a number together, honestly, isn't the hard part. It's pulling all the pieces together so you know what the number should be. Yeah. Yeah. And so as pricing people, especially in a business like yours, I can imagine that you don't really know the value or the price of anything. And what you really have to do is rely on everybody else to to help you figure all that out. Is there a specific well, I think that's where process? you get Go ahead. Yeah, so that that's where you get kind of in the competitive intelligence and the price to win piece. So, you know, pricing at the end of the day, I view price you know, the pricing team to a certain degree is we're, we're advisors, right? So we're advisors to leadership, to the operating group presidents, to the program managers. We're trying to, to show this is what the financial picture is of what they want to bid, right? When you get into competitive intelligence and price to win, you're starting to look at what the market is. Yeah. So what's, what's out there that everybody else can see out there that's open source, right? And, and so then you're starting to get a picture of, Okay, well, this is what everyone else is going to see, and that gives you, that can give you clues on where your price might need to be going forward. And so, really, what happens is, is when you combine pricing and price to win and competitive intelligence, along with the capture team and the leadership team on that, that's where you're starting to get a complete picture, and things start making sense, right? You start to triangulate different data points that are out there. You start looking within your HR teams and everything. So you understand the true cost of things. And that's where the more things that aren't variables or assumptions and become factual as you build your model up, then you start to really get your confidence up that you're doing the right things and you're getting to that right price. You've identified the risk. You've accounted for what those things are. You've written to them in your proposal. You start, you start to move away from a guesstimate to an estimate and it becomes much more precise and when, you, when we look back, right, and we'll look back at, at wins and losses on things, you start to really see just how dialed in we're, we're capable of getting something. And it's because it's not because we have the greatest pricing team in the world. It's, it's because all these different pieces are working in concert together to get us to that point. Yeah. So you mentioned competitive intelligence. And one of the questions I get a lot, and I can imagine this is a huge problem in your industry, too, is how do I know what my competitor's price is? Where do you get that information? Well, there's always companies out there that will will do the research to try and determine what other companies' cost structures might be. And we call them like wrap rates within within federal contracting. So it's at the end of the day, if if someone's making $100 an hour and they bill they bill out at $200 an hour, that company's wrap is a 2.0. And so there's companies out there that can look at that, but I usually find that to be somewhat dated, right? You're usually looking in the past for how someone's going to do something in the future, and it's not always the best. But a lot of that open source data that's out there on things like government spending and things like that, you can learn a lot about other companies from how they've won other bids. You know, you can go back and look at the RFPs that were out there for bids that they've won and try and kind of reverse engineer almost 
how they got to that point. And you get a lot of variables with that, but what you're trying to do is you're just trying to reduce the number of variables so that you have a better understanding of maybe where they can get. You know, within government contracting, you're going to end up with a certain agency. If you go out and look at that agency and who's been awarded contracts, you'll see a lot of the same players over and over again. And so you end up having a pretty tight field when it comes to things that are priced because everyone has a good idea. You know, they, people like to say the Beltway is a very small place. And that, that means that, you know, there's people constantly changing jobs. And, and so there's a lot of intelligence that's out there. But it's all about having enough time to come up with a good picture for where those things are. You know, there's RFPs that might come out and tell you what their budget are, you know, budget is. The government sometimes will do their own internal estimates for what they think that needs to be based upon what their solution might look like. Yep. So it's all about trying to get the information, but filter it, right? The key to, to how we do competitive intelligence and price to win at ASRC Federal really falls within the expertise of the team that does this and how they're able to present the data, right? So I can't give you a presentation that's three hours long and 300 pages long and expect that you're gonna get what I want you to get out of that. I've gotta help guide you through that. I've gotta tell you a story. And that's where knowing what's important in all that data and pulling that out becomes critically important. And that, that feeds right into the pricing, right? As you, as you work a proposal, you, know, you are telling a story. And so you've got to be convincing and confident in that. And if you don't know something as factual, you have to make sure that you're just upfront about those things and say, look, we've made assumptions with these three, with these three pieces of information. And that leads us to get to this point. You know, would I like to be able to say that we made no assumptions and we know this is all factual? Well, yeah, but that, that almost doesn't exist, right? You, you're going to be making some intelligent decisions along the way based upon experience, credibility, the ability to filter information into a usable format. All those things go in, into telling that convincing story, both to your leadership, right, when you get the approval to submit, but also often it goes in your, into your proposal when you look at a government RFP. They ask for price. They ask very specific questions for what they want typically. And so they want to know that you have the credibility and the integrity behind that. And so it's not just the numbers. It's how you write, how you develop your numbers. That's important. It's that credibility that goes along with that. And then, you know, I always tell my team how you present information, how it looks even, is critically important. You know, you might have the best answer in the world. And, and if you do it in crayon, you know, on a piece of your kid's, you know, drawing paper, you're not going to win the award. It's got to look good, you know, smell good, taste good. It, it's got to be 100%. Yep, it has to be professional. So I want to I want to summarize right. what the way you answered my question, just to make sure that we're on the same page. So what I think I heard you say sure. was, we go back and we look at deals that somebody else won. And we, we or somebody else has figured out an estimate of what it costs them to do that. We know what price they want it at. And so therefore, we're now learning what their margin requirements are for bidding. Is that? Yeah, it's not, it's not really as much as margin requirement. It's about understanding the labor costs that go into things, other indirect rate costs that go into things. You're trying to figure out where you need to get to from a price perspective in order to be competitive. And there are some jobs, you know, with the gov government will give you evaluation criteria. And so on some of those, it might be the, the low price, technically acceptable company is the one that will get awarded. And that bar could be pretty low for technically acceptable, right? There's other yep. ones where price is the least important one, but you always have to make sure you're within range of that. Because if you, if you say you tie technically, right, it's going to come down to price. Ultimately, it comes down to the first differentiator there. And if you tie on everything else, it's going to go down to the lower price. So you've got to understand where those things are. And so you've got to look at not just externally and look at where you've won or lost jobs before, right? We, we might have a job that another company won for a hundred million and we were at 120 million. You know, we want to try and figure out how did they get there so that next time around, we're smarter about what we did. Did they, did nice. they see something that we didn't? So we want to dig into those things. But ultimately what we find out is, you know, we've got to write, if we don't write a great re proposal, that lowers your P-win. And so if you write a great proposal, you still have to be competitive on price. But I mean, this isn't, uh, you know, the, the government is 
making sure that they get value for for these awards. And so ultimately, there's a balance in there and you can't, the evaluators will look at the technical scores, you know, and the price. And sometimes they're done, you know, independently of each other, obviously, but you, they've got to make sure that they can justify giving it to a higher price company. And that means that you have to show more value or better past performance. Something has to be worthy of them to go higher on, on the award price than the competition. Nice. John, this has just been fascinating. I'm, I'm learning a ton but we're going to have to wrap it up. So let me ask the final question. What's one piece of pricing advice you would give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? From my experience within pricing, the number one thing that I tell people is you've got to have really good relationships across all the different functional and organizational teams within your company. At the end of the day, my ability to get to the right price or to help the company get to the right price is all driven off of the teams of people that that you work with to get there there used to be a time i think where pricers had the reputation that you know they'd want to sit in their cube and just crunch spreadsheets you know that's there's always time there's always an administrative kind of side to a job right where you have to do things like that at the end of the day you've got to put a spreadsheet out there that's correct but we're using you know within asrc federal we have a small team but we cover every job that goes out of ASRC Federal. So we see what works, what doesn't work. Sometimes we can look at a job and just give you a head start or have a better path forward. But if people don't trust you because you have no relationship with them, they're not going to listen to you. And ultimately, that ends up hurting the company in the long run. Right? There's too many smart people out there. Ultimately, you got to all work as a team to get to the finish line. I got to say, I love that answer because we often look at pricing as a, as a numerical problem, but in truth, it's a social issue, right? If we're going to do it well, we have to have great relationships with everybody around us. So awesome answer. And that's not just pricing, right? That's, that's life in general. It really is. It really is. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time today, John. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? They can always email me at jpeacock at asrcfederal.com, or they can always reach out via LinkedIn. All right. Thank you so much. Episode 128 is all done. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this, would you please leave us a rating and a review? And finally, if you have any questions or comments about the podcast or pricing, feel free to email me, mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact.